The title of my sermon this morning is Flesh vs. Spirit, The Fruit of the Spirit is Joy. Second of the, the nine sermons we're going to focus on this. And as I was trying to find a good example of an illustration to start off with kind of thing about joy, it was very little, very easy for me to look and it was right on the, right with the Olympics. I figured there was multiple instances of joy, so go ahead and check this out. Simone Manuel was not expected to necessarily medal. You know, she really wasn't. There was two Australian swimmer sisters, two sisters who were going to, they were kind of figuring one would get gold, one would get silver kind of thing. Instead, as you saw, one of the, one of the Australian swimmers kind of got tired, and, and this, this lady, Simone Manuel, kind of hopped right in there and got the gold, and she actually tied with the Canadian swimmer. So there was two gold medalists in that race. Um, the, the kind of significant element here is that she became the first African-American woman to win a gold medal in a, a swimming event. Which is, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that that's never happened before. But as an individual medal, like the, um, different African American women have been in relay races, but this was the first time an African American woman won an individual gold medal at the Olympics. Obviously, she was overjoyed, and that's kind of the point I'm trying to get at. She was um, excited, as anyone would be in that situation. See, joy can be found in many different ways, in many different locations in our world today. That's kind of what I'm trying to get at here. But the reality is, all of that joy is temporary. Only true joy comes through Christ. And that's what we're going to focus on today. This morning we're going to take a look at the second fruit of the Spirit, or second spiritual fruit, listed by Paul in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. But before we do, let's go ahead and take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for all the wonderful things you've blessed us with. We praise you for the just the beautiful day that we have outside today. I mean, it might get warm, but you know what? We're content with the warmth because when winter comes, we complain about the snow. But Lord, in the end of it, we're still able to rejoice. We rejoice over multiple things. We praise you for everything, Lord. So this morning, as I, I try my best to expose the, this biblical truth, this spiritual fruit of joy, just guide me and guide each and every one of us as we try to understand what it means to rejoice in you, in your name. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And uh, we will use that briefly. Again, my text is one word, so it's kind of a, you don't really need to focus too much on Galatians the way we normally have been as, we were, as we've been going through the book of Galatians. Last week I began this, uh, this nine-part study. Really, a couple weeks I began it, but now last week we began with the first fruit of the Spirit, that being love. I told you that the fruit of the Spirit are characteristics of a Holy Spirit-filled person. They are characteristics that a Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit, which is what I believe every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit, these are characteristics that we as Christians should have. We should have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control seeping out of our bodies at every opportunity. They are the proof of a Christian's salvation. If there's no fruit of the Spirit within a Christian... The question would be, where is the salvation? That's really the bottom line here. Last week, like I said, we focused on the fruit of the Spirit of love. And this week, we're going to move right along and take a look at the second fruit of the Spirit being joy. So go ahead and look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And again, very briefly here, as Paul tells us, where would it go? But the fruit of the Spirit is love and then joy, of course. Joy being the word we're focusing on today. There are two Greek words that I want to look at this morning. The Greek word used here is the noun kara. Kara means joy or gladness, happiness. Another word that needs to be focused on is also the verb. So we're going to look at the verb and the noun. And as I'm going to tell you in a moment, the kind of the points of my sermon are taken from all the different Greek instances of these two words, which are, again, really the same word. They come from the same root. The, the, the verb is kairo which means to rejoice or be glad, to rejoice exceedingly. Again, the emphasis on happiness. The verb is also translated as a greeting in certain instances, just kind of an FYI kind of thing again. You don't, you don't even have to worry about that. Just me telling you more information than I need to tell you. Like oftentimes in the New Testament, you would see this verb translated as a, like a kind of a hello type thing, you know, a joyful greeting. 
Now, I also think it's important to point out the difference between human joy and godly joy, and I kind of hinted at this a moment ago. The joy being discussed today needs to be differentiated from the joy that humans have, the temporary joy that we often feel. The spiritual fruit or characteristic of joy coming about via a Christian salvation and spirit-filled life is one that can only be felt by a true and genuine follower of Jesus. Meaning, the only way you can truly have the joy I'm talking about today is if you are saved, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now again, this is not saying that we can't find joy in other ways and that people who don't know Jesus don't have joy. Just saying that that joy is temporary joy. It's not the real joy that we have when we have a relationship with Christ. This morning, if you can't say that you have a relationship with Jesus, then one, you need to talk to God, and two, you might not completely comprehend my sermon this morning. Because again, this is a joy that only makes sense for us. So where is real joy found? Men have pursued joy in every avenue imaginable. Some have successfully found it, while others have not. Perhaps it would be easier to describe where joy is not found. Joy is not found in unbelief. Voltaire, a mid-1700s French Enlightenment writer, historian, and philosopher famous for his wit and his attacks against the established Catholic Church, was an infidel of the most pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. It's not in pleasure. Lord Byron, a poet of the late 1700s, early 1800s, lived a life of pleasure, if anyone did. He wrote, The worm, the cranker, and grief are mine alone. It's not found in money. Jay Gloud, an American railroad developer and millionaire of the mid to late 1800s, had plenty of that, had plenty of money. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. It's not found in position or fame. Lord Beaconsfield, a politician um, from Great Britain and writer who served twice as Great Britain's prime minister during the mid-1800s, enjoyed more than his share of both power and money, or in the power and fame. He wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle. Old age, a regret. It's not found in military glory. The king of the ancient Greek kingdom, Macedon, some 350 years before Christ, Alexander the Great, conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept in his tent before he said, there is no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? The answer is simple, in Christ alone. This morning, my goal is to help you find this true joy that we have only in Jesus. After searching through, like I said, the, the different New Testament passages that use these two Greek words, kara and kairo, the verb and the noun of the word joy, I have broken down all the instances into five different categories, which end up being my five different, um, my five different points. And these are different, five different ways as Christians that we should rejoice. So followers of Christ should, one, rejoice in the Lord. Before we can rejoice in any other situation, we need to rejoice in God. Kind of makes sense, really. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We have much to rejoice in the Lord over. Again, I walk outside at night and I look up at the stars and I can rejoice. You know, I think about my family, I rejoice. All of which was given to me by God, my prosperity. Everything about me is given to me by God. I have a lot to rejoice in over the Lord. Listen to the joy expressed, though, by Jesus' followers following his resurrection from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. Um, this is, these are the women who went first to the, uh, the tomb. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. Then Jesus says in John, or not, yes, Jesus I think Jesus says, Jesus says, John chapter 20, verse 20, or no, this is John just writing, sorry. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord, rejoiced in the risen Lord. And then finally, Luke chapter 24, verse 50, down to verse 53. And he, meaning Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany and left, and he left, lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. 
And when they and and they after worshiping him returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. And that was of course right after his resurrection. They were able to rejoice over the risen Lord and well who wouldn't, right? I mean you re- the guy that you followed, the guy that you called the Messiah gets crucified and at first you're like what happened? But then he's alive again. And we should have that same rejoicing in our heart. We need to celebrate with joy our relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, verse 39 talks about the um, Ethiopian eunuch who came to know the Lord. Remember, the Ethiopian eunuch was on his way um, down the road when Philip, the, one of the deacons, came about and, and talked with him and eventually led him to Christ. And, and a eunuch is a very interesting individual. This is a person that was demasculated and completely put in a spot where he was no longer important to anybody. So if anyone had a reason to maybe cry out to God, it was this guy. And this is what happened in verse 39. When they came up out of the water. So this is Philip baptized him, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. When we come to know Jesus, we are able to rejoice. We have great greatness to rejoice. And we can rejoice over Christ, our Savior. We need to rejoice in the Lord because He saved you from hell and paved the way for you to spend eternity in heaven with Him. If you are saved, nothing can separate you from God. And that's kind of the point here. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bottom line, if you trust in Jesus, you're all set. Rejoice in the Lord because you have a Savior who saved you. And a Savior who's made it possible for us to say that nothing can separate us from Him. Bottom line. Number two, we need to rejoice in our trials. This is kind of a different way of looking at this, unfortunately. We go from rejoicing in the Lord to saying rejoicing in our trials, but if we looked at the early church, this was a big deal for them. They had a lot of trials, as most of us do as well. Life gets difficult. Even people who follow Jesus have difficulties in their lives. I think too frequently... Individuals come to know the Lord and they have this idea that everything's going to get perfect, that the, the road's going to be straight, nothing's going to get in the way. And that's by no means the case. We all know this, we all struggle, things happen. We get sick, we have difficulties at work, financial problems, we move, whatever it is. Any number of things get in the way. We have trials and hardships that face us. The reality is that life is going to bring up great difficulties, but fighting through them with joy will help us grow in Christ. James, the brother of Jesus, writes in James chapter 1, verse 2 down to verse 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So we're supposed to consider it joy and rejoice when we have hardships. And he's going to tell us why. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, meaning when we're tested, we get stronger. And watching the Olympics, you know, it gets me tired just watching all these swimmers. I mean, I'm not, you know, the marathon runners, whew, I mean, they they go crazy, the runners. You know, I, I couldn't even do it. I couldn't run the first mile, let alone the 26th mile. And these people go out and they run for 26 miles. The only way they got to that point was by training and testing themselves. They started at mile one and worked up to mile 26. The same thing goes for us. We, as Christians, are become closer to Christ. We build up an endurance when we put our trust in Him. And then verse 4, And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When we are tested, we become stronger. Peter talks to us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 down to verse 9, and it's going to flip off on your screen in a minute. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for the uh, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof 
of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, expressible in, or inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Despite your trials and your hardships, we're able to rejoice in the God in the Lord, isn't it? And that's really to me an amazing thought. The reality is that life gets difficult. The reality is that things get in the way of our walk with Christ. Things get in the way with our everyday life. Circumstances change, and it feels like there's a big boulder in front of us, or something along those lines. Yet we have a God who loves us so much that He's still there with us in the midst of those hardships. He's walking with us in the midst of those hardships, in the midst of losing a job or having a surgery or going through some sort of a, a, a medical procedure. He's there with us whenever the circumstances get hard because He's within us. He's within our hearts. Despite your trials and hardships, you can rejoice over your relationship with Christ. For the early church, yeah, this was a big deal. I mean, because they faced persecution. And a persecution in a way that we can't even comprehend today. At least we can't hear. Yet there are people throughout our world today that face all sorts of persecution that was very similar to the kind that the early church faced. Listen to what Jesus said, though. He predicted this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Blessed be you, or blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way... They persecuted the prophets who were before you. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine like, again, it's easy to read it, but imagine being in a situation where you were being persecuted or being persecuted, being insulted. I mean, another word I like to use and I like to bring up when we talk about persecution is oppression. The idea that someone's going to go and they're not going to hire you for a job because of your faith. They're not going to buy things from you because of your faith. They're not going to sell things to you because of your faith. You are forced into poverty because of your faith. Do you think you'd be able to rejoice and be glad in the midst of that? And as we're going to hear, I mean, we, we hear stories all the time on the news about Christian people, you know, being beheaded in disgusting ways overseas because of their faith. I have books in my office called um, Jesus Freaks is what they're called. They're, the DC Talk had a, band, had a song named Jesus Freaks, and it's all about people who are willing to die for their faith. And these books have story after story of people that are singing praises that they're being burned at the stake. Individuals that are so filled with the Spirit, that are so connected with God, that despite the fact that they are on their deathbed, essentially, they are moments away from being executed. Or, or worse, honestly, John, was, John the disciple was never executed. He was boiled alive, though. They threw him into a big pot of oil and boiled him. Yet he's still able to praise God. That's the relationship with God we're called to have. Another beautiful example of this is um, Acts chapter 5. And we're gonna, I'm going to read this in a moment. But after being arrested the preaching for preaching the gospel, the apostles, all 11 of the remaining apostles, were somehow miraculously released from prison. An angel of the Lord came in and let them go. And then that angel told them to go, stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. Now... I, was, I had some conflict over whether or not I wanted to point this part of it out. If it was me, and yes, you know, an angel of God would come in and tell me to do something. It'd be hard to say no to the angel. At the same time, I was just arrested and they were probably going to do bad things for me. Part of me wants to run away and hide. I mean, instead of going out and preaching and continuing to do this. I mean, if you get thrown into prison a couple times, and as we're going to find out, the, you know, of these 11 disciples, 10 of them were executed. 10 of them were put to death. I mean, Stephen is going to be put to death. Not, not yet at this point in history, but it's just beginning. It'd be a whole lot easier to run away and hide. But that's not what the apostles did. They obeyed the angel. They preached the gospel at the temple, which is where they were rearrested. And if it wasn't for this Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, they would have been possibly executed, and they weren't. But that doesn't end there. Listen to um, chapter 5 of the book of Acts, verse 40 to verse 42. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them, meaning they whipped them, and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. And if we stop there, 
And you'd be like, okay, well, I'd run away too. I'd just, I'd be gone. See you later. You know, I just got whipped and, I, you know, I just did nothing about this sounds interesting. You know, they just told me not to preach anymore. And again, part of me would say like, why not? Okay, I'll just do my thing. I'd rather not get whipped all the time. But that's not what they did. And what I find amazing here, it's not only that they chose to continue to preach. It's their, their how do you say, their emotion, if you want to call it that. Look at it. Rejoicing that they would be considered worthy to suffer shame for his name, meaning Jesus' name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and, per- and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So instead of running away, instead of hiding, instead of refusing to be a part of this, they not only continued it, but they considered it joy to be persecuted and abused the way that Jesus was abused. Could you say that? And I don't know if I can. It's, it's, I mean, it's easy to read it. It's easy to say it now. But when you're in that spot, are you able to say that I would do whatever it takes to follow Jesus? How much better will our lives be as Jesus' followers if we reacted with joy when facing life's difficulties instead of other emotions? Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 down to 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering, uh, sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. For you are reviled, for you, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. We are able to rejoice in our trials and temptations because of our relationship with God. All right, number three here as we move along now. We need to rejoice over the spiritual growth of other Christians. It is my job as the pastor to build you guys up. That's my goal, is to teach you and to cause you to become stronger Christians and cause you to take that next step and possibly you know, teach in, in a Bible study class and disciple Christian people. Um, the reason where I find this is Ephesians chapter... 4 verse 11 through 12, 11 and 12, which says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And that's where I fall into it. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. My job as a pastor is to build you guys up so that you can serve God. And that's the key to this. Uh, my job is to build you guys up. This process is called discipleship. It is teaching Christians so they grow in their faith and take on leadership roles within the church. Some of you have already reached this point. Some of you are already serving in leadership roles, teaching the kids, teaching in different ways, and then just you know doing your regular daily things of, of communicating with other Christian people. The bottom line is this is what we need to do. We need to rejoice when Christian people take that step towards Christ. When a Christian takes another step closer to Jesus and grows in their faith, their brothers and sisters in Christ need to stand up and celebrate their growth with great joy. Romans chapter 16, verse 19, Paul tells us that for the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Paul's rejoicing over the, the Roman Christians becoming closer to Jesus. John tells us, 1 John chapter 1, verse, or chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our ears, or, or what we have seen with our eyes, sorry, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John and those with them are writing and, and, and doing what they're doing, teaching the Christian people so that their joy may be complete. My joy is complete when you guys learn more about Jesus. That's kind of the point of why I get up here. There'd be no reason for me to get up here if that wasn't the case. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 down to 5, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy 
in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul is joyful over the Philippi church doing their thing and coming to know Christ more. He continues in chapter 2, one and verse 1 and 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. The work of service that I am trying to build up in you is partly discipleship. It's this, this idea of teaching other Christians, building up other Christians, and having joy over their walk with Christ, becoming closer. But I would say even more so it's evangelism, which is my second element or uh, location or however you want to word it, of where we should be joyful. We should rejoice over the salvation of a lost person. Like I said last week, there are too many people in our world today, too many of our friends and family members that don't know Jesus, that are, that are you know, predestined to an eternity in hell without Him. What are you going to do about it? We need to do something about it. The reality is that we... Now, the reality is that heaven erupts with joy every every time a person comes to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Luke chapter 15, verse 8 and down to verse 10. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? This is Jesus speaking. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is joy in heaven when someone comes to know Jesus. We need to do the same. As Christians, we need to have joy. We need to rejoice when someone comes to know God. And I think there's too many churches in our world today that don't rejoice. That don't celebrate the salvation of new people. We need to rejoice when someone comes to know Jesus as their Savior. This is part of the, the end of the story of the prodigal son. You know, the son runs off, does his thing, lives in sin. But then he decides to come home. The father sees him coming. The father rejoices over his son's returning to him. Of course, the illustration here is the father being God. The son being an individual who does not know God. That comes back to God. And then the other person in this story is the, the brother of the son. And listen to him in this situation. The brother's upset because the father's throwing uh, the son that ran away and did all this bad stuff a party. And as a result, he's upset. But this is what the father's response is to that older brother. Luke 15, 31 and 32. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. As Christians, we need to celebrate when someone comes to know the God. We need to celebrate the way the angels in heaven celebrate. And two examples of, of, of this celebration. After Stephen's martyrdom, the church was scattered to multiple locations. Including another one of the seven um, the deacons that we talked about before. I already, we already read about him, a guy named Philip. Listen to what, this, uh, what Luke writes about Philip. When, uh, verse, chapter 8 of Acts, verse 5 down to verse 6. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and, pro and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now remember, Jewish people didn't like the Samaritan people. They were, I guess, bitter enemies for some random reason. They, they would do everything it took to avoid Samaria. It'd be like me, like when we lived in San Diego. Here's a great example. When we lived in San Diego, we did whatever it took to avoid Los Angeles just because it was too much traffic. I mean, obviously different reasons. But you'd go out of your way to go around them. That's what they would do. They'd go to the other side of the Jordan River just to avoid Samaria in order to get to Nazareth and Galilee area. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds, with one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip. And they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame... <laughs> it kind of worked out perfectly there, I don't know. Many were lame and, and lame were healed... So there was much rejoicing in the Lord. Again, rejoicing in the Lord. Okay, now I got, a, I got a, a soundtrack back there. There was rejoicing in the Lord over these people coming to know Jesus. 
And then another illustration is the church in uh, Syrian Antioch. Again, this church scattered, or the Christians scattered from Jerusalem. They went to multiple different locations, one of which was Syrian Antioch. Um, Acts chapter 11, verse 19 down to verse 24. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made the way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to the Jews alone. But there were some of, them, some of them, men of Cyprus and Crene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So Barnabas, upon seeing the, these, these Gentile people, these non-Jewish people come to know the Lord, rejoiced over them. Something I wanted to point out right before we move on to my last point was that this church in Antioch is probably why a lot of us are Christians today. This is where Paul came from. This is where it all began. The Gentile church, as we would call pretty much everyone who's not Jewish at the time, began because of the Syrian Antioch church. I mean, the, the gospel began to be spread to all the nations at this point. So we need to tell the world about Jesus. We need to tell those who do not have a relationship with Christ about what he has done for us and the saving grace that we have received if you don't, their future is not secure in heaven. That's really the bottom line, which is my last point. We need to rejoice over our future in heaven. You need to rejoice over your future in heaven. Well, again, while life on this earth gets difficult, life on this earth kind of feels like we're batted around sometimes, and it just feels like it's a never-ending uphill battle. The reality is we have a future that's so much greater and something that's worth rejoicing over. We have a heaven that we can look forward to. Each human being who believes and confesses that Jesus is Lord will go to heaven when they die, bottom line. They have a hope for the future and, as a result, can rejoice in it. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. See, the kingdom of heaven is something we should strive for and do whatever it takes to achieve. I mean, that's of course the way we achieve it is by having a salvation in Christ. By believing that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And rose from the grave so that we can go to heaven when we die. And confessing that belief openly. Meaning, make that belief known to your family members, your friends. Make that belief known to everybody by coming to church, whatever it takes. Jesus also says in John chapter 16, verse 22, or 20 down to verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore you too have grief now, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. We have an anticipation or an assurance of our future because of, of heaven. Because of what we know, the, we're, what we know is at the end of the line. What we know is at the end of this road that is life. And as a result, we can rejoice now. And that's the point. We might struggle through life now, but the future is a great, is a great one for those who follow Christ. And we need to trust in Him today. Let me close up. If Jesus' followers cannot find joy in this life, nobody can. That's kind of the point. I mean, if we can't find joy, no one's going to find joy. Because like I said, the only true joy that's in this world is Christ. You might find happiness in different things. You might find temporary joy and satisfaction in different things. But the reality is they're only temporary. And they go away. Without a relationship with Christ, there is no true joy in our world. 
This world might get me down. Circumstances might frustrate me. Yet I know whom I have believed in. I have a confidence of my future because I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. The June 1988 copy of Today in the Word um, writes this. This is what's written in it. As a third century man was anticipating death, he penned these last words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found joy, which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They, have, they are des despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. You will not find lasting joy in this world. It's just not going to happen. True joy and fulfillment only comes through a relationship with Jesus. Trust in Him today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for all the things you've done for us and the blessings that you poured upon us. Help us find joy in you. As, as your followers, Lord, help us know that you're there and help us trust in you and help us just be joyful over our relationship with you. Help us rejoice over our trials and our hardships. Help us also rejoice when, when new people come to know you and when those people walk in and develop a relationship with you. And finally, Lord, help us rejoice in our future because our future is a great one. You know, other people aren't sure about their future. They're not sure what's going to happen to them. But Christians, your followers, know what's going to happen to them. We have a future in heaven that's assured for us. It's set in stone for us. So, Lord, I thank you now. I ask that you bless us and help us trust in you. In your wonderful name, amen.